the title of the talk today is The Top 15 Evidences for God and Creation. And we'll only have time to briefly go into each one. But there is uh, some good news with this. There is a, a brochure, which is courtesy of njbiblescience.org. And these will be available in the back uh, that you can take one when you leave if you're going to hang on to it for a while. And uh, you're going to see the reason in a moment. But I think anyone that's a teenager or a 20-something definitely must take one and have it uh, with them. And there's also more information available on the website, seeing as we can't cover everything today. So before we get into it, let's just open with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we do thank you for who you are, for all you've done. God, you are a great and awesome God, and we want the world to know that, Lord. And the, the evidence is just tremendous, Lord, that you are there and that you are watching over us, Lord. Help us to understand these things well and be able to explain them to others. We thank you, Lord, for everything. Amen. Well, you talk about good timing. Uh, yesterday, in fact, a new poll was announced on CNN. And the poll says, I never doubt the existence of God. Do you agree or disagree? And the answer was that 68% of those 30 years and younger say they never doubt God's existence. But what that means, of course, is about one-third of people 30 and under either doubt totally that God exists or at least doubt partially that God exists. And it's also interesting that this percentage has actually grown a lot even in just the last five years. And part of this, I think, is because the atheists out there are becoming much more aggressive in promoting their message. So evolution has, of course, always been on and off in the news, but even here in this area, Asbury Park Press one month ago, in the editorial, it says, evolution is not something one believes in any more than one believes in Newton's law of gravity. Evolution is not a matter of faith, but of well demonstrated fact, or so they say. Now, probably the world's most uh, prominent spokesman for evolution today is this man, Richard Dawkins. I think Bob even had a quote from him last week. And he says, the factual premise of religion, the God hypothesis, is untenable. God almost certainly does not exist. In one of his other writings, he also says this, that faith is the great cop-out, the great excuse to evade the need to think and evaluate evidence. Faith is, the, is belief in spite of the lack of evidence for God. And this is a message that you hear increasingly nowadays, right? People saying, gee, is, is there really a God? Is he really out there? Now, the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, and he said this, that if Christ has not been raised, that is, if there really is no biblical creator God capable of raising the dead, if Jesus really wasn't God's son, then of course our faith is futile and we're still in our sins, right? So if there really is not a real God, then what in the world are we doing here, right? We should be out doing something else. So what does the evidence actually say? Right? What is the evidence for God and that he's the creator? And what is the evidence for revolution? And can we even tell which one is true? Well, this is what we're going to be exploring today. Now, of course, the evolutionist says that evolution is science. It's science. It's well proven, as you saw from the quotes there. And what they say is that this idea of God and God as a creator, that this is a myth a myth as a byproduct of some evolutionary process. And why is that? Because to the real evolutionists, there is no need for God at all. God is not part of the picture at all. It's purely a, a natural, mechanistic uh, process that has gotten us here today. Well, I'm actually here to tell you today that the real evidence for God is, in fact, tremendous, and it is overwhelming and that our faith is there very much a thinking person's faith. We do not leave our brains at the door. Very much a thinking person's faith. And a lot of people say that you cannot prove the existence of God, but I've actually come to believe 
And I think you might see this too as you look at the weight of the evidence. I really think you can because frankly there is no other explanation. So can you prove that God exists? I actually say yes, you can. So uh, these top evidences, I've been working on this for uh, a, a few years. I've actually been studying this topic intently for 28 years now, almost 38 years. And uh, in that time, I've uh, read and studied a tremendous uh, amount of things. And this talk today, these 15 evidences, are a summary of the most important things I've learned in almost 30 years. <laughs> so I'm saving you 30 years of work and activity and just laying it out here for you, okay? So what are these? Well, first of all, let me say to start with, these are big concepts that we're going to talk about. They're fundamental concepts. They are timeless arguments. That is, you are not going to overturn any of these 15 things by some new scientific study. Oh, we thought this was true. Oh, I see this scientific result. Oh, I guess it really wasn't. No, these are timeless arguments. So what are they? Uh, we're going to talk first about the Bible's witness, information, the formation of first life, the design and beauty of living things, the second law of thermodynamics, irreducible complexity, the existence of the universe, the fine-tuning of physics, the fine-tuning of earth for life, abrupt appearance in the fossil record, human consciousness and language, human reasoning and logic, sexual reproduction, morality, and miracles. Wow, I'm tired already, just, just reading those off. So obviously, we're not going to be able to go into depth on all 15 of these. We'll hope to cover uh, some of the first ones in a little more depth and maybe uh, just briefly touch on the rest of them. So let's get right into it. The Bible's witness. Now, a lot of people nowadays have this idea that we should really start with scientific evidences and try to convince people that way and then maybe, you know, add the Bible in uh, a little later. But what I've come to see is I think the Bible is our strongest weapon. As Christians, we should lead with our strongest arguments, with our strongest weapon that we have in our arsenal. And let's not be ashamed, right? Let's not be ashamed of the Bible. Let's put it right out there, right up front, because after all, we are Christians. Now, it's interesting that the Bible does not try to prove that God exists at all. It just starts and assumes that everyone knows this. Why? Because uh, this knowledge really is. It's written on our hearts. Now, both the Bible and creation show us God, and in fact, you've probably heard that some people say creation is the 67th you know, book of the Bible. That's uh, a popular saying. And we could talk, of course, a whole lecture on this, but how do we know that the Bible is true? To me, there's two big things that, that come around. One is prophecies, hundreds of prophecies in the Bible that have been fulfilled. How do you explain that? Second, I like to look at the martyrdom of the apostles. Do you know that 10 of the original 12 apostles died a martyr's death? I mean, terrible, terrible deaths that no one would want to have to go through. And why would 10 men do this for something that they knew was a lie and untrue? So to me, that is a very uh, powerful evidence. And now, as Ken Ham of Answers in Genesis likes to say, were you there? Were you there? Who was there in the beginning to see how we actually got here, how the universe was formed, how the earth was formed? The answer is only God was there. There was no scientist there to be recording the events. So the Bible is not a book of science, but in fact it is a book of history. It's the book of history from the beginning um, you know, through the time of, uh, of the Lord Jesus and a little beyond that. And you know, if God had used some kind of evolutionary process in creating the universe and the earth and people, you know, he could have told us that in the Bible, right? He could have said, well, I started with this thing. Over time, it changed to this. You know, he could have given a story like that. We said, okay, if that's how you wanted to do it, fine. But that is, in fact, not what the Bible says. Probably my favorite verse in the Bible is this uh, passage, Romans 1, 20 to 1 to uh, 25. For since the creation of the world, God's invisible qualities, his eternal power and divine nature have been clearly seen, being understood from what has been made, so that men are without excuse, right? On the judgment day, no one's going to be able to, to say to God, well, God, if you only had given me some evidence, I would have surely believed. And then God can say, well, gee, did you look around? Did you look in the mirror? You know, did you, 
Did you look down at yourself? So there's not going to be any excuse for anyone. For although they knew God, they neither glorified him as God nor gave him thanks, but their thinking became futile and their foolish hearts were darkened. Although they claimed to be wise, they became fools and exchanged the truth of God for a lie and worshipped and served created things rather than the creator. Hey, this sounds a lot like our culture today, doesn't it? But what you see from this is this is how it's always been, actually, right? Nothing new. People are always looking for ways and reasons and excuses to get away from God because they don't want that accountability there. So what's more trustworthy? Is it really the scientific theories of man, which are always changing and which are, in fact, based on a view that there is no God, a view of naturalism? Or should we be basing our, uh, our scientific uh, ideas on the Bible, which is not changing and is inspired by God? I would say that we should be working on developing our science from the biblical worldview, giving that the precedence and not trying to interpret the Bible based on the latest scientific uh, findings. But in fact, a lot of people trying to do that uh, even as we speak, right? Taking the latest scientific findings, how can I change the Bible to kind of make this match? No, it's the wrong view. You start with the Bible, you have to take your facts and you have to put them into that time frame, right? Because nothing speaks for itself. Facts do not speak from them, for themselves. Observations do not speak for themselves. They're always made in some kind of context, some kind of framework. And so we should be putting those into a biblical framework. Evidence number two, information. Life is based on information, and information always comes from a mind and never from a physical process alone. And evolution, for sure, is a physical process based on these ideas of mutation and natural selection. And where did the information from life come from? Well, obviously, it came from the mind of God. And I want to show you first that this idea of information is, in fact, not a physical thing, but a mental thing. But people confuse the physical representation of information with the information itself. So in this, uh, this sermon, this talk, this lecture, this message, whatever you want to call it this morning, information is going from my mind into your mind. There's a flow of information here. But this information, this talk, could be represented what? On a hard drive, on a CD, you're watching it on a screen, you're hearing me talk about it, you can see it printed on a piece of paper. The point is, the information content is the same in all those cases, right? But the physical representation is much different. And what does that tell you? It tells you the information is not physical, it is a mental idea represented in different ways. And we're not going to go into the details on this, but... In the idea of evolution, it starts with no information, and somehow over time, information increases, increases until we get all of the information in the DNA and all of the cells of our body, which is a lot of information, about six billion pieces of information. However, what the Bible says is that originally God created each kind, and when he created each kind, he had an idea in his mind of certain plants, of certain animals, and of people, and he instantaneously put that into effect. And so uh, each animal, each plant, persons, Adam, all had all of the information that they needed right there in their DNA already present at the beginning. But of course, because of the fall of man, the sin of Adam and Eve, there has been a degradation over time, and there has been a uh, diversification of some of the original kinds into uh, other species. For example, the original wolf kind is now various kinds of wolves, various kinds of dogs, but all descended from this, this wolf kind. So information, you know, there's really no answer for it in an evolutionary view, and, but from the Bible and a creation view, there's a very good explanation because it has come from the mind of God. Evidence number three, the formation of life. Spontaneous generation is impossible. You've all seen that in your textbooks, in your science classes, right? Louis Pasteur in his famous experiment uh, proved this. And, you know, back in Darwin's time, people thought the cell was very simple, like a blob of jelly. They called it protoplasm. But nowadays, we know much better that the cell is really a complicated, complex miniature factory. 
And you know what? Many experiments have been held trying to create life in the test tube, so to speak, but they've all failed. And why is that? Because even to get the very simplest life, you need a lot of information, content, to describe all of the processes that need to take place. So here's a modern picture of a cell, and there's lots of different uh, uh, activities and centers in there, a lot of communication. It really is like a little factory with lots of things going on. Now, you may have seen this, the uh, famous Miller-Urey experiment, and it's interesting that this experiment from 50 years ago is still the best evidence that you see for life in a test tube, so to speak. Uh, we were at a museum a couple of uh, years ago, and on the wall was a picture of this, as if this ex somehow explained how we got here. The truth is, all that was created by this was a few amino acids, the very, very basic building blocks of life. It's like taking you know, one little step, and you have to go a mile. I mean, it's that small of an activity. And it has many problems with this, and we won't go into that, but many scientific problems. And in fact, Dr. Miller himself has stated publicly now that even he himself does not believe this, <laughs> that you could ever get the start of life through this mechanism. But yet you still see this on museum walls and in textbooks. And any ex anytime someone's touting as their best evidence something from 50 years ago, you got to believe that something funny is going on there, right? I mean, where is all of the, uh, the new advance? Evidence number four, the design and beauty of living things. You know, when you see design, you have to believe that there is a, a designer behind it. And we're going to look at this in a second, but the example of the monarch butterfly life cycle really does prove Darwin wrong. And in terms of beauty, you know, evolution is based on this idea of survival of the fittest. It's simply surviving, reproducing, simply living. And beauty is really unnecessary uh, for that, is it not? Now, there are hurtful things in nature, and how do we explain that? Well, we know the sin of Adam and Eve, and God cursed the earth. And so some things that used to be perfect, well, they're not perfect anymore. So we have that as an explanation. Uh, you may have seen this uh, example in the past. Uh, theologian William Paley, he, um, in the late 1700s, put out this argument that if you find a watch in the sand, you immediately know someone designed that because the uh, particles of sand are not going to get themselves together and build a watch. And he said in the same way, it applies to people, right? Uh, you know, chemicals and things are not going to get together to form people. Therefore, there must be a designer. Uh, people have knocked this argument or quite a bit, but I think it really is still a very, very sound argument, and increasingly so. But let's look at this uh, monarch butterfly. So you start with an egg. Out of the egg comes a caterpillar. After a couple of weeks it goes into this chrysalis stage, where is literally its insides are chemically dissolved and decomposed into a state of, of goo, you might say. And then in the, after that, the tissues of the butterfly are reformed out of the same material, and eventually a butterfly comes out. And you know what? It's the butterfly that lays the egg to start all over again. So how can you explain this by an evolutionary process? You can't, because first of all, evolution says things change just a little bit, a little bit at a time, a little bit, a little bit. You know what? If you cannot get through this chrysalis stage in a single generation, you're done. You're toast. End of line, right? No more caterpillars, no more butterflies, no nothing. And you know what? This process is so complicated that scientists today do not even really understand how it works this dissolution and the recreation of the tissues. So to think that that's going to happen all by itself in a single generation is an utterly ridiculous idea. And I would say after my almost 30 years of study, if I have to give you one example to talk about with somebody, this is it. Why? Because everyone's familiar with this, it's easy to understand, and it is utterly unexplainable. I've looked on the internet for explanations from evolutionists, and they can't even touch it. Why? Because you simply cannot explain this. So this is a very uh, powerful evidence. How about beauty? This is a picture from the Philadelphia Flower Show. Lots of different types of uh, pretty flowers there. Now, once again, uh, evolution says survival of the fittest. 
That's all I really care about. But beauty reflects God, does it not? You know, God is a very creative God. All of us here look different from each other. Look at the amazing variety of the flowers, the animals, the plants, you know, the vast universe that God has made. He's a very creative God. And so this idea of beauty really points to God, and it really has no place or explanation from an evolutionary perspective. Evidence number five, second law of thermodynamics. Wow, I didn't know I was going to science class today. Okay. What does it mean? Well, it means that things naturally mix and decay over time, and we're all familiar with this. You know, if you don't paint your house, it's going to start to rot away. If you don't weed your garden, other plants you don't want are going to start growing in there. That is, there's a mixing of plants you want and plants you don't want. Okay? So this concept for this idea is the second law of thermodynamics. Now, interestingly, evolution proposes just the opposite that over time, order and complexity increased. And you know what? The only way to overcome this law of thermodynamics is by applying and harnessing directory for a specific purpose. In other words, if you want your garden to look good, to overcome that second law of thermodynamics, you have to apply energy, that is yourself, and you have to direct it. That is, you have to go in the garden and pick out just the weeds and leave the other plants. And so by doing that, you can overcome the second law of thermodynamics, but it takes work, and the work has to be specifically directed. Now, sometimes this is referred to as time's arrow, and it's simply the idea that, once again, the second law of thermodynamics says that over time, things will mix and decay. In fact, if God lets this whole thing run long enough, the universe would die a heat death, right? Because all of the stars would burn up all of their energy. The entire universe would be at the same temperature and nothing could happen. So this is quite clear. In fact, they say this is the most proven law in all of science, the second law of thermodynamics. But what does evolution say? It says that somehow in the beginning, there really was no information or order and complexity. And somehow over time, we've gotten to a highly ordered state that we have today. So the fact that evolution says the exact opposite of the most proven law of science, I think is pretty fundamental. <laughs> and this is a very uh, strong argument. Evidence number six, irreducible complexity. Wow, more big words. What do these mean? Well, basically it means that nothing works until everything works. And a lot of your biological structures in the cell exhibit this property. The idea is that evolution cannot produce functioning complex structures in a single generation. And we saw this with the chrysalis, right? Because that would be a complex structure that you cannot form in a single generation. And, you know, evolution has no foresight. So any partial structures that would start to get created, if they would, they would be selected away because they have no value. In other words, everything has a, only has a value when it's working in conjunction with other things to do something useful. Now, the famous example in this area is from Michael Behe, and he coined uh, this term, by the way. And his example is a mousetrap. A mousetrap is a pretty simple device uh, with only uh, five parts. But you know what? If you go to the store and buy some of these and bring them home and open them up and a part's missing, you're going to return it to the store, right? Because it's, it's useless. It's not going to work. So the idea here is you need all of these parts operating together in the right place at the same time or it doesn't work. You're not going to catch any mice with this. I mean, maybe you'll catch a random one who would stab himself on the stick or something, but in general, you know, it's, it's just not going to work. So you take one part away, and it's no longer function. And if you think about an example in the body, so you have a circulatory system, you need a heart to, to pump through the veins and the arteries, you need a brain to give the signal to the heart. You need all those things at the same time for it to make any sense and for it to work, right? What good would be veins and arteries without a heart? What good would a heart be without a brain to signal it? So you take any of these things away, it is simply not going to work. And so how can an evolutionary little bit at a time, little bit at a time process explain this type of integrated complexity? And the answer is it cannot. Next idea, the existence of the universe. And I love this chart. Let's see if you can follow this one. So fact number one Nothing cannot produce something. And I hope you really believe that, that if you have nothing, you can't get something. 
Fact number two, we have something. We have you, we have me, we have the church, we have the universe. So we definitely have something. Therefore, something is eternal, and there's only two choices. Either the universe itself is eternal, or something bigger and greater than the universe, which we could call God, is eternal. Only two choices in this. Why? Because otherwise, if neither of these were eternal, then there was a time when there was nothing. And if there was ever nothing, then it would always be nothing, because you cannot get something from nothing, right? <laughs> Fact number three, the universe has been shown to have a starting point. Secular science calls this the Big Bang. Therefore, it is not eternal. What is your conclusion that you're left with? An eternal God must exist. A very simple, logical exercise, pretty powerful. But what does the evolutionist say? Believe it or not, they doubt fact number one, and that they say, in fact, you can get something from nothing. That's their only out of this. But I would say what they call nothing is not real nothing. It's actually something. So that's the problem. But anyway, you get, you get the idea here. It's, it's kind of interesting. Evidence number eight, the fine-tuning of physics. The physical constants that control physics are really on a knife's edge. Try to make a minor change in any of them, and life would be impossible. So, you know, if the universe has really started in this... Uh, mode of just random processes. Uh, the idea that our universe would have these specific um, constants is uh, really impossible. So what are some of these constants? They're like the, the mass of the proton, the electron, the weak and strong nuclear forces, uh, gravity, electromagnetic force, the relative strengths of these things, the speed of light. Believe it or not, all of these, you change any one of them very, very slightly, it all falls apart and we don't have life. How does the evolutionists get around this? Because they've realized this is a big problem. Their answer is there's many universes. They call us the multiverse theory. And what they say is we just happen to be in the lucky one where the parameters are just right. That is their answer. But when you talk about other universes, obviously this can never be proven. So that is not science. It's science fiction. So true science can only talk about our universe. And this is a big problem for the evolutionists. Evidence number nine, the fine-tuning of Earth for life. You know, the Earth really is just right for life and for the same reasons we just talked about on the fine-tuning. Um, it's an impossibly small occurrence to get everything just right on the Earth from a, a random evolutionary beginning. But we know that God created the Earth as a special place, didn't he? Because this is the place for the people that he loves, you and I. So what is some of this fine-tuning? I've put some of these up here. We're not going to go through them. But one, for example, is if we were just a little closer to the sun, all the water would boil away. If we were a little further away, it would all freeze. So you have to be within plus or minus 5 to 10% range in our orbit for the conditions we know today to be true. Otherwise, all the water boils away or it freezes. But there's many, many other uh, tunings also. Abrupt appearance in the fossil record. Uh, all of the body plans of the different types of animals, and secular scientists says this, they call it the Cambrian explosion. It's like all of these animals, they just appear at the same time. Isn't that amazing, right? And all of the oldest fossils are already fully formed and don't change much over time. And we can look at the little diagram here of a geologic column. So at the bottom in the so-called pre-Cambrian layer, these would really be the creation rocks, and you really don't find fossils there. And then it's as if everything suddenly came to life at the same time in a geological instance. Well, what we say is this is Noah's flood. This represents the start of Noah's flood, which was countless dead things buried in rock layers all over the earth. And yes, there is some kind of evolutionary appearance in there. But why is that? Think about this. The smarter you are as an animal, the more mobile you are, that is the more advanced you are, the longer you're going to be able to escape the waters. Right? A snail doesn't know it's being flooded, but a deer knows it's being flooded and it's going to go to higher ground. So it's not surprising that you see then in the fossil record simple organisms to more advanced organisms as you go up and up. But the basic explanation, it's how long can you escape the flood waters? And we say that that is a much better explanation. 
Also, you see in the fossil record this idea of abrupt appearance and stasis, big words. What does it mean? It means flowers have always been flowers, animals have always been animals, people have always been people, and that the oldest fossils you find, they already look like what you're familiar with, and they really don't change much uh, over time. And by the way, you don't really find the missing links. The missing links are, are still missing. What does the evolutionists say about this? Because they admit this. Uh, Stephen Jay Gould was the one who uh, come up with this idea, punctuated equilibrium. It's the idea that evolution happens in, in local areas and it happens quickly. So there's no record of it. Local areas and quickly. Well, isn't that handy? <laughs> So, well, gee, I'm so convinced of evolution, it must be that it happens locally and quickly because there's no trace of it in the fossil record, even though I know it's true. But the fossil record really does support uh, creation. Uh, these uh, next five, we're just going to breeze through uh, kind of quickly. Uh, evidence number 11, human consciousness and language. And something's happened. Maybe I hit this by mistake. There we go. You know, the evolutionists will say that you, in your brain, it's just chemicals swirling around in there. That's what you are, right? You're just a machine. You're just a bunch of chemicals. Well, if that's what we are, it's really hard to explain self-awareness, right, that we have. And how do we explain free will and decision-making if we're just uh, a bunch of chemicals floating around in our brains? And, you know, language... The animal gruntings in human language are like miles and miles apart. And people that have tried to train, train animals to talk, well, you haven't really seen that yet, have you? And, but the Bible has an explanation, of course, why we have different languages at the Tower of Babel. God told the people to repopulate the earth and spread out, but they didn't. They decided to stay there, build a tower. God said, oh, not a good idea. And he confused their language, forced them to move out. So there is a good biblical explanation for why we have many languages Evidence number 12, human reasoning and logic. You know what? Unless you believe in God, you can't even really reason and rely on your reasoning. And why is that? You know, if you have chemicals swirling in your brain and you have chemicals swirling in your brain, and I do also, why should we think that they're all going to produce similar kind of logic and reasoning and results? We wouldn't, right? It would be totally random whatever we came up with. But yet the fact that we have logic and we can reason together and understand together means that it's really not just random chemicals going on in each of our brains, that there's something deeper there. And, of course, we know that God gave humans reasoning abilities. Why? So we can choose to love him. Animals don't have that because animals don't choose to love God or not love God, but we as people, we do. Sexual reproduction, number 13. Well, it's certainly unexpected from evolution and unnecessary and actually has a lot of uh, uh, disadvantages, although it does have some advantages also. So this idea that somehow uh, you can develop two sexes where there was just one before and have them develop together is really uh, an absurd idea. So when you think about this, at some time you had creatures reproducing asexually, right, just one sex, but at some point you had to have matching males and females created in one generation or it's not going to work. And as the males and the females evolved independently, unless they were always able to connect with each other, end of line, right, end of the, uh, end of the, uh, the race. So this is a, a huge problem, and in fact, the evolutionist here, Graham Bell, he says, sex will be powerfully selected against and rapidly eliminated wherever it appears. And yet this has not happened. <laughs> but yet he still believes, you know, in the evolutionary idea, but he can't explain it because it's unexplainable. It's that fundamental. Morality, number 14, humans are born with a sense of right and wrong, but you know there's no morality in matter, is there? It just is there. And I like what it says here in Romans uh, chapter 2. It says, God's law is not something alien imposed on us from without, but woven into the very fabric of our creation. There is something deep within them that echoes God's yes and no, right and wrong. You may have saw it, I think just this week, there was a, uh, a well-known atheist blogger 
who's now decided to become a Catholic, and this was really her reason for it, is she could not explain why there was right and wrong, you know, good and bad, if there was not a God. So that's, that's quite an interesting thing. Uh, last evidence, number 15, miracles. You know, miracles are recorded in the Bible, many of them, but miracles still take place today from many reliable uh, people. And how do we explain that? It really requires some kind of supernatural uh, cause, and we won't go into that uh, further. But if we look now, what is the best evidence for evolution? Stephen Jay Gould it said it's three things. We see that things can change a little bit. I point to the fossil record. I point to imperfections in nature. But the fact that things can change a little bit, well, that's a good design feature, right? So that things can adopt to uh, different environments. And you know, artificial breeding, it always hits a limit. You cannot keep breeding cats and get a dog. You're always going to get another kind of cat. And why is that? It goes back to evidence number two, information. You are limited by the information content in your DNA as to what you can become. We've already talked about the fossil record, and I think Noah's flood is a better explanation there. Imperfections in nature, we also touched on this. The fact is that God cursed the earth, and when he did that, decay and degradation has set in. So the earth, animals, we're not what we used to be at the beginning. We're a little bit less than that. So despite all of these big evidences, what is the main reason that people will not believe in God? It's really this. It's evil and suffering. And of course, this can be a whole set of talks in and of itself. But we do have a couple of explanations as Christians, and it doesn't minimize when someone's going through suffering, but at least in your head, you know, there's a couple of arguments here. First is we're not robots. God gave us free will, right? And since we have free will, some people will decide to be good. Some people will decide to be bad. And it has to be that way if people have free will. And God wants people to come to him on their own with their love. He's not going to force it. So he did not make us to be robots. Reason number two, the sin of Adam and Eve. Once again, this started a decay process leading to death. And God actually cursed the earth. And when he did that, he removed some of his sustaining power. So now we have physical calamities like tornadoes, tsunamis, and other things like that. So these are the two primary explanations for evil and suffering. But, you know, Jesus himself said this when he was with us. He said, in this world, you will have trouble. So when any of us have trouble, we should not be surprised. The Lord Jesus himself said, you will have trouble. But it also says in Romans that we know that in all things, God works for the good to those who love him, called according to his purpose. And Greg Sylvester has been going through some of these ideas in his uh, Sunday school class. But ultimately, the idea here is that in God's grand tapestry of taking everything that happens and taking our free will decisions into account, he is going to take whatever bad things happen and somehow make something good come out of it. And we, has, we can't always see that. We may never see that. Maybe we'll see some of it in heaven. Oh, yeah, I see what you did with that, and that, that makes good sense. So evil and suffering, yes, not fun to go through, but ultimately it's expected, and we know that good in the end comes out of it, even if it's not good for us at the moment. So in the end, what do we see? Well, we see that the idea that there is a God, that he is the creator, is very well supported by ideas like information, design, fine-tuning, the fossil record language, and that this is reality, a very real thing. On the other hand, the idea that there is no God and we got here by some evolutionary process, the evidence is very, very weak, despite what people would tell you. And in the end, it is evolution that is the myth, not religion. All right. Now, so evolution says I came from an ape, but the Bible says I was created by God, and aren't we glad right? And aren't we glad? So in closing, I would say, you know, take heart that the evidence, the real evidence, the true evidence is all on our side and that your faith is very much justified. You are not here because you're blindly believing in some abstract faith thing that has no basis in reality. No, the reality is very, very sound. In fact, it is un deniable. And so you are here for a very good reason. And 
this is a message that we have to let other people know, especially our young people know, that this faith is not a blind thing, but it's a very real thing. And not to be dissuaded by the so-called experts, right? There are scientists, there are school teachers, there are college professors who will all tell you as authority figures that most of what I told you today is not true. But use your own brain. Look at, look at the actual evidence for yourself and you will see that this is very strong evidence in spite of what other so-called experts may tell you. And when you look at what they tell you, sometimes it can sound convincing for a little bit, but then you've got to step back and say, oh my gosh, you know, you only told me half the story. And look at, look at these 15 things. Certainly any one of them by itself can disprove what they're saying, but you put all 15 together, man, there's just no way that the fact tremendous and it is overwhelming and that our faith is very much a thinking person's faith. We do not leave our brains at the door. Very much a thinking person's faith. And a lot of people say that you cannot prove the existence of God, but I've actually come to believe, and I think you might see this too, as you look at the weight of the evidence, I really think you can, because frankly, there is no other explanation. So can you prove that God exists? I actually say, yes, you can. So uh, these top evidences, I've been working on this for uh, a, a few years. I've actually been studying this topic intently for 28 years now, almost 38 years. And uh, in that time, I've uh, read and studied a tremendous uh, amount of things. And this talk today, these 15 evidences, are a summary of the most important things I've learned in almost 30 years. <laughs> So I'm saving you 30 years of work and activity and just laying it out here for you, okay? So what are these? Well, first of all, let me say to start with, these are big concepts that we're going to talk about. They're fundamental concepts. They are timeless arguments. That is, you are not going to overturn any of these 15 things by some new scientific study. Oh, we thought this was true. Oh. I see this nowadays, right? People saying, gee, is, is there really a God? Is he really out there? Now, the Apostle Paul wrote in 1 Corinthians, and he said this, that if Christ has not been raised, that is, if there really is no biblical creator God capable of raising the dead, if Jesus really wasn't God's son, then, of course, our faith is futile, and we're still in our sins. Right? So if there really is not a real God, then what in the world are we doing here? Right? We should be out doing something else. So what does the evidence actually say? Right? What is the evidence for God and that he's the creator? And what is the evidence for revolution? And can we even tell which one is true? Well, this is what we're going to be exploring today. Now, of course, the evolutionist says that evolution is science. It's science, it's well proven as you saw from the quotes there. And what they say is that this idea of God and God as a creator, that this is a myth, a myth as a byproduct of some evolutionary process. And why is that? Because to the real evolutionists, there is no need for God at all. God is not part of the picture at all. It's purely a, a natural mechanistic uh, process that has gotten us here today. Well, I'm actually here to tell you today that the real evidence for God is in doubt God's existence. But what that means, of course, is about one-third of people 30 and under either doubt totally that God exists or at least doubt partially that God exists. And it's also interesting that this percentage has actually grown a lot even in just the last five years. And part of this, I think, is because the atheists out there are becoming much more aggressive in promoting their message. So evolution has, of course, always been on and off in the news, but even here in this area, Asbury Park Press one month ago, in the editorial, it says, evolution is not something one believes in any more than one believes in Newton's law of gravity. Evolution is not a matter of faith, but of, well, demonstrated fact, or so they say. Now, probably the world's 
most uh, prominent spokesman for evolution today is this man, Richard Dawkins. I think Bob even had a quote from him last week. And he says, the factual premise of religion, the God hypothesis, is untenable. God almost certainly does not exist. In one of his other writings, he also says this, that faith is the great cop-out, the great excuse to evade the need to think and evaluate evidence. Faith is, the, is belief in spite of the lack of evidence for God. And this is a message that you hear increasingly. So the title of the talk today is The Top 15 Evidences for God and Creation. And we'll only have time to briefly go into each one. But there is uh, some good news with this. There is a, a brochure which is courtesy of njbiblescience.org. And these will be available in the back uh, that you can take one when you leave if you're going to hang on to it for a while. And uh, you're going to see the reason in a moment. But I think anyone that's a teenager or a 20-something definitely must take one and have it uh, with them. And there's also more information available on the website, seeing as we can't cover everything today. So before we get into it, let's just open with a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we do thank you for who you are, for all you've done. God, you are a great and awesome God, and we want the world to know that, Lord. And the, the evidence is just tremendous, Lord, that you are there and that you are watching over us, Lord. Help us to understand these things well and be able to explain them to others. We thank you, Lord, for everything. Amen. Well, you talk about good timing uh, yesterday, in fact, a new poll was announced on CNN, and the poll says, I never doubt the existence of God. Do you agree or disagree? And the answer was that 68% of those 30 years and younger say they never scientific result. Oh, I guess it really wasn't. No, these are timeless arguments. So what are they? Uh, we're going to talk first about the Bible's witness information, the formation of first life, the design and beauty of living things, the second law of thermodynamics, irreducible complexity, the existence of the universe, the fine-tuning of physics, the fine-tuning of earth for life, abrupt appearance in the fossil record, human consciousness and language, human reasoning and logic, sexual reproduction, morality, and miracles. Wow, I'm tired already just, just reading those off. So obviously, we're not going to be able to go into depth on all 15 of these. We'll hope to cover uh, some of the first ones in a little more depth and maybe uh, just briefly touch on the rest of them. So let's get right into it. The Bible's witness. Now, a lot of people nowadays have this idea that we should really start with scientific evidences and try to convince people that way and then maybe, you know, add the Bible in uh, a little later. But what I've come to see is... I think the Bible is our strongest weapon. As Christians, we should lead with our strongest arguments, with our strongest weapon that we have in our arsenal. And let's not be ashamed, right? Let's not be ashamed of the Bible. Let's put it right out there, right up front, because after all, we are Christians. Now, it's interesting that the Bible does not try to prove that God exists at all. It just starts and assumes that every 